Good morning. Good morning. Hey, welcome to Sunday morning worship here at Hollywood UMC. Thank you for joining us in person and those of you online. And if you're able, please stand. We're going to sing two opening hymns.
Good morning. I'd love to invite all the children to the steps up here before we head off to Children's Church. We have uh, Children's Church today, which will be in Grant Hall, and then we have our youth group that will be in the Grace Room today. So we're happy to have you all here. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. So I have a question for you. Who Raise your hand if you've ever been in an airplane. Okay. Most of you, all of you, great, good, good. Raise your hand if you've ever been like, if you've ever hiked to a really tall mountain. You want a couple, sort of? Okay, it's a a mountain, maybe not super, super tall. Um, Raise your hand if you've ever walked across a bridge. Any of those, have you ever walked across? Okay, so when you're in those places, a plane or uh, up really high on a mountain, does anything ever happen to your body? Like to your ears or to, what happens? What are some things that happen? Ian, do you want to say? No? Uh, my ears sometimes pop. Yeah, your ears pop, right? It's a, what happens to you? My ears plug. Your ears plug, and sometimes your ears plug. That's right. And if you ever climb a really tall mountain, sometimes it gets like you're out of breath, even though when you're walking normally, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be out of breath, but because you're so high. So air is an interesting thing because our bodies have to adjust. If we're really high, sometimes our ears have to release and we have to slow down our breath and we have to take it easy because it's hard to breathe because air is different. The air here is a little different than the air way up there. In children's church, we're talking all about air and how important it is. We, could we live without air? No, we need it to fill our lungs, right? So we've talked about shelter, we've talked about food, we've talked about water, what's that? You need to breathe. You've got to breathe. Yeah. Breathing is so important. And you all, some of you that were here last Sunday, you wrote a poem I heard. Did you write a poem in Children's Church? Was that fun? Yeah. yeah. Can I read your poem that you wrote? Yeah. Okay. So this is direct. Oh, gosh, I got to keep my glasses on. <laughs> uh, this is direct from Children's Ministry. And I can't see a thing. So let me read you this poem that they wrote. God, your breath fills me with peace. God calms my stress released. Breathe, breathe everywhere. Air, air everywhere. Breathe, breathe everywhere. Our breath will fill our hearts with care. Isn't that beautiful? Can you thank our children for writing that amazing poem? So impressed. Yes. So as we continue in our talking about all the things that we need to live and how we as caretakers of the earth that God has created for us. We're going to pray and ask Jesus to guide us and the Spirit to teach us today in our children's church. So let's pray together. Creator God, thank you for this place, for our families, for our church family, and the chance to just stop and think and be in awe of your creation. And thank you that we get to experience life, and you have provided for us shelter and food and water and air. Help us to take care of those things. Help us to make sure that all people have those things. Clean air, clean water, a place to live, and food to eat. I pray that you would raise up these children to be people who live like you live, Jesus, who love the world, and who see as part of their job to take care of the world and the people on this planet. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we head off to Children's Church and to Youth Group, I invite you to stand and pass God's peace to one another. And also before you sit down, let's uh, give some peace and wave up to our production crew up there and also the camera that all the people online, we miss you. I'm still saving front row seats for you, so come next Sunday. All right. Uh, As we enter into a time of prayer, let's take a few moments, calm our minds, sit back, take a few deep breaths. And let's rest in the presence of God as our chancel choir leads us in a time of prayer.
Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, we thank you for this time where we can pray together as a church family. We humbly look to you for direction and guidance as we bring our praises and the concerns of our heart to you, knowing you just want us to confide in you, to rest in you. We lift up the prayers of our church family. We pray for Courtney, Quinn, Marina, Preston, and the Stanton family. Continued prayers for those who need healing of mind, body, and spirit. We pray for the healing of Rev. Kathy as she recovers from a bad cold. We pray for all those who are struggling and feeling unsettled. Some of us feel lost, lonely, or anxious. Some have financial concerns, work hardships, or a broken heart. Lord, may we remember Psalms 71:20. I have seen troubles, many and bitter. You will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. Please draw us closer to you. Calm our spirits. Quiet our fears. We pray for peace and hope to those who are suffering from war and violence. Show them that you are there, that you care for them, and you will make all things right. God, we pray for a world full of love and compassion that we may be good stewards in this world and not prey upon it, that we may sow beauty and not destruction. Knowing you are always there for us, may we now individually lift up to you what is on our hearts in a moment of silent prayer. Thank you for the power of grace that you continually bestow upon us. We seek your grace in our emotional, physical, and spiritual healing. May you allow it to work in us so, so that we may find comfort and solace in your presence. And now we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Happy wet Sunday morning. Thank you for showing up, getting your umbrellas out, and uh, spending some time here with us today. Uh, let's check in. Get those phones out. Scan that QR code if you would. Um, we've been getting a nice number of check-ins over the week. So put your name in there. Just let us know you're here. If you want to be part of the email list, you can put your email in there. But more importantly, if you have any prayer requests, there's a space for that. Please drop those in there if you feel the need to share. We get those every Monday and we pray over them throughout the week. So share if you're able. Now, if you're a first time visitor, I'm just going to put this out here. Thank you very much for spending the morning with us. And after church, I have a little welcome bag for you in the parlor. So come see me at the welcome table and I'll get that to you. Also, we have a new event flyer. Well, I've been talking about it for a month, but it's new to some of you. Uh, you can grab one of these in your pew pocket or also on the welcome tables outside or in the parlor. It has everything coming up for the next five months, believe it or not. Some, some of the bigger events. Uh, today, I just want to talk about some of the events that are happening. Um, today, we have Project Angel Food. There's about 17 of us volunteering, and we're going to head over there. 
after church. Got to be there by one for training. So um, can just go over to their parking lot and park in the back or on the street. Or if you need a ride or if you can give a ride, let's all meet in the parlor and we can talk about who can uh, share and who needs some rides over there. Um, also today, we have the Sol Sunday Adult Study Group, and that's with Rev Ed and Tim Payne, and that's meeting in the chapel after church at 1215. The one thing that's being canceled, because Rev Kathy is not feeling well, is the membership class is going to be postponed till next week, so we'll have that again next week on Sunday after church. Uh, one thing I do want to get on your calendar, just so we have a lot of people that come and help out, May 5th, we're doing a blessing bag build in the gym. Uh, and those bags uh, we put out in the narthex, you can take home with you. But um, they're to hand out to people in need if you come across somebody while you're out and about running errands or in your neighborhood. It's a little bag full of supplies, um, toiletries, and some food and water. Uh, so come help us build those on May 5th after church. Everything's happening today in the parlor because of the rain, so we'll meet over there for some sweet treats and some coffee and tea afterwards. But we have a lot of great things coming up in the next few months, and all of this happens because of you. Through your prayers, your presence, your service and volunteering, and also your financial gifts. So as the ushers come forward and we put up a QR code for online giving, please give as you're able so we can continue to grow this ministry here in the heart of Hollywood. Thank you for being here today.
A reading from 2 Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Receive what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Between my head and my heart, they say seeing is believing, but I only see myself reflected in the current of the great unknown. I need a savior to carry my head and heart on. Well, good morning again. I'm on this side now. Uh, I am not Rev Kathy, if you haven't noticed, but uh, she's at home healing from a really bad cold. I think she's had too much Bruce Springsteen over the past few months, but uh, um, we're praying for her to get better quick. Uh, but today we are continuing our Sermon Tide series based on the book by Adam Hamilton called Wrestling with Doubt. Finding faith. You know, everyone has doubts. We often treat our questions as the enemy of faith, but uncertainty doesn't mean our belief is lacking. Doubt can be a path to a deeper, a richer encounter with God. And today, we're not only going to wrestle with doubt, but we're going to wrestle with the Bible, otherwise known as the good book. Now, the Bible is our touchstone and the foundation of our Christian lives. And that said, there are parts that are confusing and seem to be in contradiction. Let's look at why that might be. The, the, the Bible is a library of 66 ancient documents. The first 39 we call the Hebrew Bible, and the last 27 make up the New Testament. The 39 books of the Old Testament comprise a wide array of genres, including Israel's history, her defining stories, her songs, her prayers, her poetry, and her prophets, challenging Israel's sin and promising redemption. The 27 documents in the New Testament include four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus, the Acts of the Apostles that tells the story of the Holy Spirit in the early days of the church, and 21 letters called epistles, written by various apostles. Um, and uh, those were designed to give instruction to the early church. And finally, of course, let's not forget the apocalypse or the revelation of John. Now, Hamilton notes that these documents were written and often edited by dozens of people over perhaps a period of about 300, I'm sorry, 1,300 years. Now, the biblical authors were very human and wrote with a particular purpose or multiple purposes in mind. They didn't close their eyes and uh, have God move their hands. In fact, some likely had no idea they were even writing scripture. And even though we often speak of the Bible as the word of God, we know real imperfect humans wrote each word of the various documents to make, make up our Bible. They wrote in the light of their knowledge and their perspectives about life and their experiences of and assumptions of God that they held. And in this context, we see that the Bible is actually words of people, but also of inspiration from God. Our scripture today is Paul assuring Timothy that every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching or for showing mistakes for correcting and for training characters so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. So on one hand, we have really fallible human authors. And on the other hand, we have God's inspiration on them. 
as they write within their historical and cultural contexts. What could go wrong, right? Now, there have been many throughout history who see the Bible as the infallible, inherent word of God. You might call it uh, the God said it, I believe it, that settles it strain of Christianity. Who believe that the first six words of Paul's letter, every scripture is inspired by God, means that every word is of God. But here at Hollywood UMC, we are not allowed to check our intellect at the door when we come in. We know that's not true. If you believe me, please believe our favorite president. Forgive me, Dr. Jacobs. Are you an MD? A PhD. A PhD? Yes, sir. In psychology? No, sir. Theology? No. Social work? I have a PhD in English literature. I'm asking because on your show, people call in for advice, and you go by the name Dr. Jacobs on your show, and I didn't know if maybe your listeners were confused by that and assumed you had advanced training in psychology, theology, or healthcare. I don't believe they are confused, no, sir. Good. I like your show. I like how you call homosexuality an abomination. I don't say homosexuality is an abomination, Mr. President. The Bible does. Yes, it does. Leviticus. 18.22. Chapter and verse. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions while I had you here. I'm interested in selling my youngest daughter into slavery, as sanctioned in Exodus 21.7. She's a Georgetown sophomore, speaks fluent Italian, always cleared the table when it was her turn. What would a good price for her be? While thinking about that, can I ask another? My chief of staff, Leo McGarry, insists on working on the Sabbath. Exodus 35, 2 clearly says he should be put to death. Am I morally obligated to kill him myself, or is it okay to call the police? Here's one that's really important, because we've got a lot of sports fans in this town. Touching the skin of a dead pig makes one unclean, Leviticus 11:7. If they promise to wear gloves, can the Washington Redskins still play football? Can Notre Dame? Can West Point? Does the whole town really have to be together to stone my brother John for planting different crops side by side? Can I burn my mother in a small family gathering for wearing garments made from two different threads? Think about those questions, would you? One last thing. While you may be mistaking this for your monthly meeting of the ignorant type, Club. In this building, when the president stands, nobody sits. <laughs> ah, some good TV. All right, so the next takeaway of this sermon, though, is the Bible was not written to or is never supposed to be used as a weapon to dehumanize or devalue anyone. As the psalmist says, we are each holy and wonderfully made, and God loves each of us equally without exception. Amen? Because the Bible is neither inherent or infallible, but rather the inspire, inspired word of God given to humans who interpret the spirit in their own culture and context. In other words, the word of God is found within the words of the people who wrote down the poetry, the letters, the texts that make it up. And because it was written by humans, it has elements which do not reflect the timeless will and the heart of God, but instead the norms of that day in which it was written. So it's up to us to wrestle with it and decide which portions are driven by historical and cultural context and which parts we can feel God's spirit breathing through them. Now, we know that St. Paul was bound by the culture of his time. In the Bible, in the Bible's entirety, including Paul's words, there's over 300 verses that refer to slavery. All but a couple refer to the ways in which a master should treat a slave and a slave their master. Do we think that confirms the Bible is not just tolerating but accepting slavery? Absolutely not. This is one reason it's very important to remember the words of Karl Barth, one of our greatest theologians of the 20th century. 
God speaks through the Bible whenever we choose to finally listen. The Bible contains the words of God and the breath of God in it and through it. But the unmitigated word of God is Jesus Christ and his life's his teachings, and especially his great commandment, love God, love one another. And we should consider these two great commandments as the colander through which we filter the Bible every time we read it. Everything that remains should be considered as compatible with the two great commandments and the lessons we should hang on to. Those things that wash out are things we need to come back, consider, wrestle with, because God is big enough for us to wrestle with what others thought God wanted included in the scriptures. We should have hoped that Paul would have been a stronger spokesperson against slavery, but in only a few verses in Galatians, neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free do we see Paul offering true equality in Christ in this lifetime? In the lifetime to come, we are assured of equality. When it comes to women, it seems to Hamilton that Paul is more concerned with the immediacy of building the church, and that's why he devotes so much of his writings to how women should comport themselves in church. Now, in the historic Catholic Church, it was thought that since Jesus didn't choose a woman as one of his disciples, that means a woman's not fit to be a pastor. But women were present at every event in Jesus' life, his birth, his death, his resurrection. The account captured by John, plenty of Jesus' encounters with women, like the Samaritan woman at the well, his friendship with Mary and Martha, and many others, but the gospel writers didn't write all of it down because it could have been too radical to try to have the gospel be accepted. Now today, many churches will quote Paul's reading as the reason why we shouldn't allow women to assume positions of leadership, especially Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Women should be silent in the church, for they're not permitted to speak but should be subordinate as to the laws. And if there's anything that they desire to know, they should ask their husbands at home. <laughs> oh, Paul. Now, many of us have also taken Rev Ed's uh, homosexuality, in, homosexuality in the Bible class, which debunks the clobber passages in both Old Testament and New Testament. When Paul takes up the issue of same-sex relations in the first chapter of Romans, he seems to have in mind at least two of the three ways the Old Testament passages can be seen as addressing ritual sexual encounters tied to pagan worship and idolatry. The idea that was what was natural was normal and clean, and what was considered not natural was unclean. But for Paul, who clearly manifests his ties to his culture and his writings about slavery and women, he could also be calling out something else. In Romans, something that's not always understood. In the first chapter of his letter to the church in Rome, Paul is denouncing idolatry of any kind, his purpose being to build Christ's kingdom and church. One form of idolatry was ritual prostitution, and this was found in the pagan temples where older men would take younger men as, um, we should say, uh, apprentice, um, which we would all view as exploitation. But be, to be very clear, the six clobber passages in the Bible regarding same gender relationships, none of them refer to or pertain to committed loving relationships or marriage, none of them were said by Jesus. And none of them stand on their own when placed in context in the culture of the time in which they were written. And this morning, we have intentionally focused on the parts of the Bible that many, many folks find stumbling blocks in faith. 
Now, we didn't even get into the whole war and plague section, and I know Rev. Kathy has talked about having a short sermon series entitled The Horror Stories of the Bible, uh, which he's always wanted to do. But in reality, the different passages are rough, the difficult passages, rather, are roughly only 5% of the entire Bible. 5% out of 30,000 verses. And somebody else that's good at math can figure that out. Um, but only 5%. And, and the point is that, as Hamilton puts it, the Bible tells us the story of God's redemptive love, God's power, God's purpose, and God's will for our lives. And yes, its human authors were people of a different day, but many of their experiences of God are timeless and powerful. And it's truly the good book. Amen. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, quick benediction before we leave. As you go today, let's remember those two commandments from Jesus, to love God and to love one another. And whether we're reading the Bible or just living out our daily lives, remember to filter everything we do through that. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>